What's up, guys? I'm Emerald Marie, and be sure to check us out on the web at realfansrealtalk.com. This is your African King's Come, Michael Blackson. You're watching Real Fans Real Talk. Get real with it, my son. What's going on, guys? It's Legend of Two Games, repping for Real Fans Real Talk. Uh, we're a couple days away from the NFL draft, so I had to bring a good friend to the show. My man Shawnee on the mic from On The Board Sports is joining us. Uh, Shawnee, what's going on, man? Eric, man, thank you for having me on, man. No How's problem. Everything? Man. everything is good, man. You know, quarantine time, we all stuck in the house. How are you holding up during this time right now? You know, man, I'm just like everybody else, man, just stuck in the house. But you know what, man? I'm just trying to do the best and make the best out of of what we have, just trying to just uh, stay on the grind and record and all that stuff. So definitely, I appreciate you, man. No Have doubt, man. Up. I see I see you guys have made an adjustment as well. Um, obviously, during the quarantine, you weren't able to get into the studio, but you guys have had some episodes of the podcast come out. Um, and I see you even got, you guys got the blogs going now on the website as well. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, man. Um, It's actually mostly Will, man. Will is like... Will is like a mad like scientist like when it comes to certain things, man. So Will was like, yo, Sean, man, let's do the blog. I was like, yo, it makes sense to have a podcast and to do the blog too. So that's exactly um what we did. We started up that. And yeah, like it's been weird having to do the shows through Skype or Zoom and then having to make it from this to that video and audio, but everything has come out soon. We have a bunch of new um episodes out now. Some that we already did that we're gonna drop in like the next uh two, three days, probably like a good week max. So everything is going good, man. That's what's up. That's good to hear, man. I'm glad to see you guys still working. Cause you know, we definitely appreciate what you guys are doing on that and with on the board sports, man, for sure. Likewise, man. Thank you, brother. No doubt. So now let's get into it, man. Like I said, we're two days away from the NFL draft. All right. Now, your Tennessee Titans, you guys had a really good run at the end of last season, um, getting into the playoffs as a wild card, ultimately knocking off the Patriots and probably ending that dynasty. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when it went into Baltimore, beat league MVP, Lamar Jackson, knocked those guys out. And you guys for, for about a half put a really good scare into the Kansas City Chiefs before Patrick Mahomes got it going there. Talk about last season and some of the joys and then what you have expecting, uh, what you're expecting, I should say, coming into this season. You know what, man? We were probably playing playoff football from probably like week like 13 and 14 because we were once a six and six and Eric, man, the playoffs look real bleak. And then we went on the run and Derrick Henry, I mean, that guy's a machine. Like that man is a man amongst boys, man. So we got him. And like you said, the last pass that Tom Brady threw was intercepted by Tennessee Titans, Logan Ryan, a former, a Patriot too, a pick six. And we win the game. And then we go into uh, Baltimore. Eric, man, I ain't even going to lie to you. I was like, all right, the Patriot win was nice. Baltimore about to drop like 50 on us. <laughs> and the fact that we were able to go and not only win the game, but dominate the game the way we did as a fan, it surprised me. And like you said, the next week, the Chiefs, for a half, we kept it close. But that touchdown run that Patrick had at the end of the first half, I was like, we about to lose. Because you could feel the momentum shift. And it was just like, oh, man. And then they scored like two more times. And you know what I'm saying, and we lost. But it was certainly a season that I had a lot of fun watching. Um, I'm thrilled to see what we do um, uh, coming up. Uh, Tannehill is back. I ain't going to lie to you. I don't think I would have gave him $118 a million, But when you have a good uh, quarterback, that's what you have to do. Henry, we franchise tagged him. So we are trying to work out the long-term deal with him. And so we still got a few holes to fix. We're in the Jadavion uh, um uh, uh, Clowny Mix trying to see if we could get him. I think he wanted like 20 to 21 right. per. I think he's dropped his price down to like 16, uh, 17. So we're in the mix. So if we could get him, if we could nail the draft this week and to go and to add the guys that we brought back and the new guys that we brought in, I'm excited to see what we could do, man. 
Absolutely. I mean, you, you touched on it. Derrick Henry is building a, a quite of a reputation for himself as a big time runner uh, in November, December, and January. Um, yeah. You know, a couple of years ago, he, he had some big runs late in the season. Um, and then now to see what he did this year, leading the league in rushing, he was an absolute beast in the second half of the season. And you could see guys were, they didn't want to tackle. There were guys, there's a highlight floating around where he stiff arms Earl Thomas like three times in that playoff game on the same run. He, yeah, he, he turned him around. Yeah, yeah. he stiff arms yeah. him, he turned around and he pushed him in the back. And then as Earl tries to turn around again, he's bushing him out the way. So <laughs> he definitely went off. And, and you were right, man. Um, the, you guys were up, I, I'll never forget, you guys were up 10 points in that AFC Championship game. Yep. And they score, and then Mahomes gets that run. And in a, in a matter of minutes, it went from down 10 to being up four, going into halftime, like you said. And that completely flipped the game for you guys. You weren't able to get the running game going in the second half again. Um, right. You talk about Tannehill, man. Were you uh, in the group of people that wanted them to go hard after Brady, or were you in the other camp that said, no, nah, let's, let's run it back with our same guys again? I was in the Brady camp only because I don't think Derrick Henry is going to be with us long term because we know the unfortunate uh, stigma. Uh, 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 back. So once they get to 26 or 27, it's time to go and draft a guy that's 20, uh, 21 and run him uh, into the ground until he's 26 and 27. And then just kind of like him saying like a circle back. So the fact that I think Derrick Henry is only going to be with us maybe another two, three years, just my gut, I would have went after Tom because I'm like, I think Ryan is good for the next four or five years because he's only like 30 or 31. Tom is 40, 41. So I would have went after Tom only because I feel like the strength of our team is running the ball. And can you just picture the play-action pass with Tom Brady and Derek, that play action pass that Henry's going to open up, the defense is going to play the run, and that's going to open it up for guys down the field, A.J. Brown and Corey and all those guys. So I would have went after Tom, but I'm not mad that we brought um, uh, uh, Ryan back. Yeah, I agree. I think they, it would have been a pick-your-poison situation with them, um, with Tom and his ability to get the ball out quick and get the ball down the field. Uh, I, I, from what I've read and from what I've heard, they were sold on Tannehill's mobility. Obviously, as you mentioned, he was younger, and they wanted to kind of keep the continuity together from what they had last year. And they didn't want to give up the option of they, – they love rolling Tannehill out and having him throw on a move. And like you said, even though they don't hit the big plays down the field as much with A.J. Brown as they should, they just like the, the ability to play action and roll out and do different things with him. But we're going to see, you know, see how it plays out. Um, in regards to the AFC South as a whole, we've seen the Colts brought in a new quarterback. Uh, the Jaguars look like they're completely rebuilding. There's now Leonard yeah. Fournette is on a trade block. Um, mm -hmm. The Texans look like they have absolutely no clue in what they're doing <laughs> over there. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the division as a whole right now? As a whole, um, I'll go Houston first. I didn't know that that their coach and the De DeAndre, I didn't know that they had beef. So, but to me, you don't trade pound for pound probably the best wide receiver in the game or definitely top three. You don't trade him for a second round pick. I think it was a fourth or fifth round pick. And David uh, Johnson is pretty much damaged uh, goods uh, at this point. You got to get back off like two firsts and a third for someone of the Andre and Hopkins. So they're definitely going through it. Bill, I mean, if you look at the guys that they have, the guys could play Cooks and Will Fuller, Randall Cobb, Kenny Stills, but all those guys are prone to get hurt. So Houston, we have to see. And Houston has to win because there's only so much great years that Watt is going to give you on the other side. I mean, he's been playing at a Hall of Fame rate the past four or five years. They have to get something done while he's still in his prime because I think he's on uh, the way down. Like you said, uh, Jacksonville, they're blowing up the whole thing. And to think that two, three years ago, they were in the AFC Championship game. They had a lead in the fourth quarter at Gillette Stadium. And to two, three years after, for them to just blow, just to blow up the whole thing, man, I, I don't even know what they're doing there. But for me, a Titan fan, that's good. Let them rebuild for the next nine to ten um, seasons. 
My only concern is the Colts. The Colts are going for it. You don't bring in Phillip Rivers. You don't pay him $25 million for one year, and you're not going to go. And they've made some big-time moves. Xavier Rhodes, they brought him in. And there, and the big-time trade, that DeForest Buckner trade, it scares me because he's probably the most or one of the most underrated defensive linemen in the game. And those holes that Derrick Henry had when we played the Colts, the two times, those holes may not be there. Like, he's that great. So I think the biggest competition to the Titans are the Colts. And um, the Titans now, I mean, it's just can we repeat what we did uh, last year? Because nobody thought we were going to beat the Patriots. We did that. Nobody thought we were going to beat Baltimore. We did that. For a half, we had the Chiefs shitting bricks for, <laughs> right. for a good half. <laughs> so I just mean, you know what? So so the division as a whole, it definitely got weaker because guys like Hopkins left and Brady didn't um, come in, so on and so forth. Uh, Jacksonville doing uh, the day whole thing. But I think it's going to be a two-team race. But Houston is a sneaky team because – even though the Andre left, if those guys don't get hurt, if Cobb doesn't get hurt, Stills, Fuller, and Cooks, Houston could put up um, a point. So it's a weaker division, but it's definitely going to be one, um, one to watch. Yeah, I, I think it's still competitive. I agree with you. Um, I, I put in the blogs, like kind of going at Bill O'Brien because I just don't understand what he's doing. <laughs> Um, as you said, DeAndre, to me, and, and any conversation when you're talking about wide receivers, if he's not number one, he's probably number two. He's right, right. there. Um, so to give up DeAndre for a running back who has been on the downside the last few years and has been injury prone, and then to use that same second round pick you got for DeAndre and flip that on Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks has had about five concussions in the NFL. Like right. he, he could be on his way out, as, as you mentioned. If he's healthy, he's very productive. He's a speed demon down the field. He makes a lot of big plays. But the key word is if he's healthy. And that's the same thing we can say about Kenny Stills and Will Fuller and Randall Cobb. You know, Randall Cobb is the crafty veteran that gets open out of the slot, but he's got to be healthy to do it. And, right. you know, it sucks because it was cool. Even, even though it was a division rival, it was cool to see Deshaun Watson and DeAndre Hopkins work together and kind of build up this dynamic duo of quarterback and receiver. So that's no longer there. Um, the Titans, you guys still scare me though, man. You guys are bringing back pretty much the same squad from last year. The only guy you're missing, it, you brought in Vic Beasley from the Falcons. Um, ho yeah. yeah, hopefully he's, you know, he found what he had early on in Atlanta when he was a big time sack guy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you talked about bringing back your guys. Um, Jarrell Casey, though, he's one of the big guys on your D-line from last year. He's gone. Talk about that a little bit. That surprised me. And to only get a seven round pick, form the Broncos fleeced us but I understand when you when you have to pay certain guys you got to make certain calls and Jarrell Casey he was the heart of that team the soul of that team one of the captains of that team and they say oh well he was declining I don't see that I still see a guy that was still pushing the pocket throwing the tackles around throwing around the guards uh, tackles for loss, uh, so on and so forth. But he also had one of the bigger contracts on on the team. And so we just drafted Jeffrey uh, Simmons, who I think is going to be a beast. Uh, last year, they play the same spot. So it's like we're going to lose the heart and soul of the team, but we still need the cash to pay uh, Ryan, the 118. And if we sign... Henry, long-term, are going to need the money for that, too. So that was a tough, tough loss. But like you said, Vic Beasley coming in, a lot of people forget. I think it was two, three years back. Beasley led the NFL in uh, sacks. I think he had uh, 17 or something. So he definitely can rush the guy. I think he was misused. I think Vic is a guy that I don't think he's big enough and strong enough to put his hands in the dirt. I think he has to stand up and he just has one job, 100 miles per hour. Go, just go, just go. Shoot up the field, shoot up the field. So I think Vrabel is going to do a good job with him, moving him from left to right, bringing him from north to south, um, so on and so forth. So we lost Casey, 
but we bring in a Beasley, a younger guy, a one-year deal. But I like when these guys have the one-year approval deals because you know they're going to go absolutely insane that one year to get the bigger deal at the end of that one year. So, so we shall see. I agree. I, I like um, Vic Beasley. Um, the season you're talking about, I believe that's the year that the Falcons went to the Super Bowl. And he right. was an absolute beast that year. And his versatility is his biggest strength. He can, like you said, he's not best suited to be a down lineman. He's more suited as like an outside linebacker that rushes or that can cover running backs coming out. And maybe right. going to Tennessee might be the best fit for him. Mike Vrabel was that type of uh, linebacker himself. You know, a versatile right. guy who could do a little bit of everything. And so maybe Vic going there and under that tutelage and under that staff, he might be able to uh, redefine his career a little bit. I like it, though. I, I like it for you guys. Again, low risk, high reward. Um, exactly. You know, worst case scenario, he comes in. If he doesn't play that well, again, it's a one-year contract. He, he wasn't a guy that was a big part of the playoff run last year. So you'll kind of – you'll kind of make up for that with the guys that were already there. Um, exactly. What about you? You talked about Jadavion earlier. Um, Will and I, last time we, we spoke about, because obviously him as a Jet fan, the Jets are in the mix with Jadavion as well. What right. are your thoughts on Jadavion? Do you like it? Do you not like it? And ultimately, what, what number of a contract would you be comfortable with if you guys were able to get him? See, the Clowney thing is a very tricky thing because when he's on the field, I, I mean – I mean, he, I mean, he scares you. And the guy, like, he plays the run well. He plays the pass well. But the issue is when he's on the field. He's been hurt so much. He had the knee issue. He had the back, uh, certain others. And so, and then he only had three sacks. So it's like, you want 20 million plus a year to only give me three sacks? Like, you're a defensive end. I don't care how well you play the run. Defensive... Uh, tackles are there to play the run. As as a defensive end, I need you to get ten plus sacks every year if you want twenty million plus. So, I think it was smart for him to lower it. And truth be told, I still want to give him what he brought it down to because it's only three sacks. So I would say I have I would give him a four year sixty million dollar deal, fifteen per. I think that's fair. And if you want to kind of sweeten the deal, maybe give him like $35 million uh, guaranteed. Give him most of that $60 mil uh, guaranteed. But there's no way that I'm giving him more than 15 a year for three sacks. But the other thing is, he's a bigger guy. He can put his hands in the ground yes. and rush. But I think he's better suited playing that outside linebacker rush too because he's – I mean – He's he is the closest thing to Javon Curse that I've seen. Javon Curse was an absolute freak, and Clowney is the closest thing that I've seen that uh, the guy that could do just so many uh, different things. So, four years, sixty million dollar deal. If he wants more, he could go back to Seattle or to the <laughs> Jets with Will <laughs> and so on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, I, I agree. Um, uh, I, I I don't know. The four years might be a little steep. Um, I, me personally on Jadavion, I like him. I think he is an impact player. He played really well for the Seahawks in their two playoff games. Right. right. Um, but he is also one of those guys that deals with a lot of ticky tack injuries. Um, as you mentioned, he may be better as a stand up outside linebacker in a three, four system, similar to what you guys run as opposed to hand in the ground. His best days were with Houston when he was in that same role kind of an outside linebacker that got to the quarterback. But also, if he needed to fall out into the flat, he could do that as well. Um, I think if you guys get him, I'm be honest, I think if you guys get him, um, you, I think Buffalo uh, is another really sneaky landing spot for him. Yeah. That, that could tilt the scales of the AFC a little bit because your secondary is really good. Um, mm -hmm. I, I personally feel your secondary is the strength of your defense. And if right. you can add just a little bit of more pass rush, you know, if you can get Vic Beasley going, if you add a Jadavion Clowney, now you're talking about a really complete defense. And I think right. the Bills are kind of in that similar situation. Um, you know, they, they got uh, Trey White out there in Buffalo. They got uh, Poirier in the secondary. You know, their secondary is really good. Their front four is, is solid. Um, they still got Ed Oliver at D-tackle. But they don't have that dominant pass rusher. If exactly. you guys were to land them or Buffalo were to land them, I think that really tilts the power in the AFC there. Buffalo is is uh, a good spot, and 
as good as their uh, defense is, they had Houston on the ropes in that a playoff game, and they let Houston come roaring back, yes, they and did. they lost the game for exactly w- what you said. They could not touch Watson when it mattered most. Like, in the fourth quarter and overtime, he was chilling and doing his thing. So, that would be a sneaky move, because now if you add a clowny, and now you got, like you said, Poya roaming back, playing a free um, uh, a safety, and Tredavious White is He's, I mean, because he plays with the Bills, a lot of people don't talk about him that much. He's solid. Yes, he's he is. really good. So if you add Clowney to that mix and they added Stephon Diggs, I don't know if Diggs is a number one guy. I think he's a great number two. I don't know if he's a, a number one guy, but the fact that they're going to put up more points and now – if you are now saying you put Clowney at defensive end, I think that's pretty, pretty good. Yeah, Buffalo's going for it, um, and yeah. rightfully so. The, the division, as, as Will and I were talking about before, the division is wide open. Um, we know Miami's rebuilding, of course, but mm. the Jets are trying to position themselves now. Um, the Patriots, we don't know what they're going to do at the quarterback spot. And so Buffalo is basically saying we're all in. We were a playoff team. We need to take the next step. I do think they overpaid for Stefan Diggs. Um, yeah. which, mm-hmm. Again, might be another indictment on Bill O'Brien, as we talked about before. Bill O'Brien can't get a first-round pick for Hopkins, but yet the Vikings were able to get a first-round pick for Diggs. For Stephon uh, Diggs, right. Right. So, uh, again, w- w- you know, but enough, enough uh, jumping on uh, uh, Bill O'Brien's back about that. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to crush him too much about that. Uh, but I, I think Buffalo's going for it, and I think, honestly – you know, as a Colts fan, you as a Tennessee fan, I think us in our division, we should feel the same way. You go for it and you take your shot. I don't think yeah. the Chiefs are unbeatable. I think, right. you know, they're very explosive. They got a lot of weapons offense. Um, you guys went in there. Not only did you, uh, you came close to beating them in a playoff game, but you played them very close in a regular season game when you You're played right. them last year. We beat them in a regular season game, and the formula was pretty clear. You got to be able to run the ball. You got to be able to get to the quarterback. And so, I, I you know, I think this is a year that if you're an AFC team, you can't be scared off by the Chiefs. You got to look at it and say, look, are we close enough and what moves can we make to kind of close that gap? I said, uh, said it before the game. And I, and I was like, San Fran, that defensive line was crazy. But I said, if the 49ers play an offensive line that can block them, their secondary is not good. And the Chiefs, they didn't block them the whole game, but they blocked them when it mattered most to give Mahomes that extra half a second to a second to get the ball down the field. But I agree with you. The Chiefs won the Super Bowl, and their defense was average. (laughs) It was in the middle of the pack, and they won the Super Bowl. And like you said, the Colts went in there. The Colts went into uh, an arrow Mm -hmm. with Jacoby Brissett and beat them. So that just goes to – I'll show you that the Super Bowl champs, that if you, I mean, now it's easy, you know, because when you have a Patrick Mahomes, who I think he said like a couple months ago, he learned to read a defense this season. Eric, do you know how scary that is? Very scary. <laughs> he learned to read Very a defense scary. this season, to, which means that he was just throwing darts, just he to was throw just, darts. He was just reacting. <laughs> He basically he played the quarterback position just reacting. He just reacted. Like, that's right, man. So, so I, I would say the Bills, the Colts, the Titans, uh, Baltimore. If Pittsburgh could get their act together and the Chargers, I think those are the top five, six teams that could challenge the RG. Okay. So, let, let's transition a little bit of a, dra- a draft talk. We're two days away from the draft. Um, I asked Will this question as well. Um, if completely healthy, who would you prefer, Tua or Joe Burrow? Tua. And okay. I'll tell you why. I'm not the biggest Joe Burrow guy for two reasons. Joe Burrow, before he got to LSU, everybody knows he was at Ohio State. Joe Burrow could not beat out JT Barrett and Cardale Jones. I'm sorry. If you can't beat out JT Barrett and Cardio Jones, now he goes to 
in LSU. That entire an offense between this draft and next year is going to get drafted. That entire offense, the running back, the tackles, the guards, and they had the best quadruplet wide receiver core that we're probably going to ever see. They had two guys catch over 100 passes. That is crazy. And the guy that won the Belitnikov, he caught less passes than the guy that led the NCAA. So that's how scary their Dolphins were. I say that to say this. Joe Burrow was surrounded by a lot of NFL talent. Now, I know Tua was as well. But the reason why I go with Tua is Tua, a legs on him. He doesn't use them, but Tua could escape left, escape right. And I know he had the NFL um, 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 uh, offensive line and the receivers and Saban being the coach. But I just think from a talent standpoint, I think Tua is more talented than Joe. I think Joe had the benefit of just throwing to guys that were just wide and open. On top of that, LSU's schedule was very hard uh, last year, and he won uh, every single game. Tua, Tua's only issue is he gets hurt. Now, that's a big if. But but I just think from a pure talent a standpoint, um, a pound for pound, Tua's the guy. I'm, I, I just don't see it with Joe. I think Joe's going to be good, but I don't think he's going to be great as people may think that he is. I, I understand it. I, I think the health of Tua is a major concern. Um, mm-hmm. I agree. I'm not, I'm not down on Joe Burrow. I think Joe Burrow is going to be a solid quarterback, but I think Tua's total body of work um, is just <clears> too <throat> strong to ignore. And I agree with you. If, if they're healthy, his ability to move around the pocket, make the plays down the field, and we've seen him do it multiple seasons. Um, yep. Where Joe Burrow, we, we got the glimpse for one year, and it, it, it scares you a little bit because, you know, is this the real Joe Burrow or is this, you know, a guy who was a flash in the pan, as you mentioned, that just had a lot of weapons and looked really good for that one season? So, right. And, 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 and it's just like, and like you said, he just had the one year. Two more won the national championship as a freshman. An eighteen-year-old kid coming in throwing that uh, 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 touchdown pass because Hertz was playing. I'm sorry, Hertz was not playing well. Right. So Tua, <laughs> right. So, so he comes in the game, and that's another big reason why Nick Saban is a great coach. You know that when it comes to him trusting you, that his trust has to be really high. Nick Saban trusted a true freshman in a championship game, not the fifth year senior, a true freshman. To me, that speaks volumes of the type of a player Tua is and the, two, and the play that he's going to be. I, I completely agree. I, I think it's going to be interesting on Thursday. Now, uh, back to your Titans. You guys have the 29th pick of the first round. You have three picks overall in the top 100. What side of the ball do you want to see you guys address more, offense or defense? <laughs> Defense. Um, I know you said that our uh, secondary is good, which it is, but I think Malcolm Butler may be a cap casualty next year because he's another guy that's got him hurt. I think he's 30 plus now. I think he's 30 or 31. And I think his cap hit for 2021 is going to be like, like 12 and a half. And I don't think, I don't see the Titans playing a uh, declining Malcolm uh, uh, a Butler, a 12.5. So I think you have to go in a secondary first. We also need a guy to replace uh, Jarrell on the defensive end side. So I would say we, we eventually need to get a third or fourth wide re, uh, receiver. And then we eventually need a uh, backup for Derek uh, 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 Henry. I think we, we, I think we could get those, uh, those guys you know, the fourth or the fifth round. But two of the first uh, three picks, definitely the defense. I completely get you on that. You want to load up on the defensive side of things, right? All right. So we're going to see how it goes Thursday. Now let's let's switch it up a little bit. Uh, NBA season, obviously, we're all waiting to see if it will come back. Do you think we will get a finale to this NBA season, or do you think we will be left with an incomplete 2019-2020 uh, NBA season? Eric, me, me and Will speak about this like like every day, and 
it's hard to see the NBA coming back for the simple fact of the playoffs were supposed to start this um, weekend. The playoffs did not. Now you're talking about going into May, going into June, because the playoffs are like a two, three month thing. And to me, you have to finish the regular season up. And the biggest thing that scares me is these guys, when they come back, it's like they're going to need a training camp uh, number two. Like they're going to need to get back in shape because I doubt every single NBA player has stayed in shape during this uh, whole thing. So all these guys are going to have to get back in shape, one, and back in playing shape, number two, because as we know, in shape and playing shapes and playing shape are two different uh, things. So I don't see them coming back. I was hoping they could come back around May, but now, and I think what's holding them up is different states are saying different things. Different states are saying, yeah, we're going to open back up in May. And then you have a New York who's banned the large of uh, gatherings. I think like through uh, through like through the next uh, um, a couple of months. So if the Nets make the playoffs and the city is banned from the large stuff, how can you have that? How can you have a certain uh, uh, thing? So to me, it's gonna be tough for them to uh, for them to uh, uh, make it back. I, I agree. I think it's going to be, I think there's too many hurdles. Um, as you mentioned, um, different policies within each state, the health of the players, are, are they in shape? Um, and then obviously, can you get this thing up and running fast enough to actually get a full run of the playoffs? As we know, normally the playoffs start in April. They don't end till June. Um, as you mentioned, we would have already started the playoffs. So how much longer are we going to wait? Um, are we going to complete the regular season? Are we going to go straight into the playoffs? How is that going to play out? I think there are a lot of question marks. And as you and I were talking, I was looking at my phone because breaking news just came through. Uh, the Patriots have traded Rob Gunkowski to Tampa Bay along with the seventh round pick for the fourth round pick of the Bucks. So Brady and Gronk are reunited in Tampa Bay. That is crazy. That is crazy. It probably means that OJ uh, and Howard is on the way out. I know that he was on the block uh, at the end of uh, last week, but – to have Gronk back in the NFL, that just adds to the already explosive in offense that they had because they had Mike and Evans and Godwin. And now not only do you add Gronk, you add Gronk after he had a year off to rest. So that offense is going to be crazy. They still need to fix the offensive line. I think they still need to add, uh, add a back that could catch the ball. But if they add those two things, that front seven is very good. So um, I think, and, and you hit it right on the head, I think adding Gronk is to help with the pass blocking. Um, they let Rashard Perriman go. He just signed with the Jets. They are probably not going to do any more three wide receiver set. It's probably going to be two tight end, two wide. So they'll still work O.J. Howard as kind of their passing tight end. Gronk will stay in and help on blocking a little bit more. But ultimately on big third downs and obviously in the fourth quarter, Gronk will probably be heavily involved in the passing game. But I think Gronk has been brought in for that reason. He knows what Brady likes. Uh, he, him and Brady are already on the same page. You know, they could, stay, uh, they could shoot a, a stare at each other and kind of know what they're thinking. But ultimately, he really helps in the blocking game. And now, as you said, if they could find a uh, running back, um, a Deion Lewis type, you know, a guy like that who can come in and just help with the quick passes out the backfield, they may be completely set on offense. They still got to get an O-line, though, in my opinion. Yes, definitely, definitely. The, the offensive line uh, last year. Now I know uh, uh, Jameis threw the uh, through the thirty picks. A lot of those picks were not him. A lot of those picks he had no time to throw. So, but yeah, if they uh, fix that line, that offense is going to be scary now. Yeah, I, I I still think the lines got to get better um, for what they like to do and and them. They want to air it out. Bruce Arians, you know, he loves to get the ball down the field. He wants to take the shots down the field. The flip side of that is your quarterback's got to stand in there and be willing to take some hits to throw it down the field. And we all know Brady is one of the smartest quarterbacks. The moment he feels pressure, he will not take the big hit. He'll right. go down before he allows you to get that big hit on him. Right. That's probably going to be the biggest hurdle for them to overcome in this offense because Brady's going to have to be patient enough to stand in there and know, 
I'm going to take a few shots to my ribs and my chest to be able to get this ball down the field to Evans and to Goodwin. And so it, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But obviously adding Gronk just gives him another weapon. I didn't think Gronk was going to come back. Like, I mean, he's won his rings and he's one of the greatest uh, tight ends uh, to ever play. You could say that he kind of uh, transformed the game. Like him, like him and um, uh, Gates really, really transformed what being a, uh, of what being a tight end is and, doing what a tight end is uh, supposed to do. So it's glad to um, uh, see him back. And Bruce, in areas, he knows how to draw up plays and to put points um, uh, on the uh, board. So it's going to be very, very – it's going to be – I wish that they did hard knocks with the Bucks, especially now <laughs> that Gronk is back. It's going to be a very funny, funny thing to uh, – that, man. We, we got to do the research. Obviously, the news just came out, so we didn't get a chance to look into it. Is this right. the first time that a WWE champion has been <laughs> on an active NFL roster? Like, current I champion. So. Current Great. champion. Current we know champion. Brock, remember, Brock tried to do it as well. Brock, Brock tried to do it. Do right. it. Um, right. you know, Goldberg's initial career was as a, as, as a football player, and then he transitioned right. over. But right. he just won a belt, what, two weeks ago? He did, yeah. <laughs> he and now did. he's on, he's on an active roster. We got to figure out how that how that plays out, man. That would be a great uh, tr- um, uh, trivia a question one day, man. I'm gonna, really- I'm gonna have to look into that, man. I'm gonna have to look into that. All right, so <laughs> one more one more question before we go. As you can see, I'm wearing my, my Mets hoodie today. Yes, um, unfortunately, you and I we're both Mets fans, and we both were very optimistic about this season. The last time I was on on you guys' show, we talked about it. We thought this team had the potential to not only be a playoff team, but possibly make a deep run. Um, right. And now we're probably three and a half weeks in. The season hasn't started yet, obviously, with everything that's going on. Do you think we'll see baseball this year? Baseball, yes. Because I think baseball can give themselves a little bit of more leeway. They play into late November. I'm sorry, late October. And depending on the year, early November as is. So uh, to me, if they have to stretch it into late November, early December, I think that they can. But MLB has to really tell themselves, there's no way we could play 162 right. games. So I think if they decide, listen, we're going to start the season June 1st, who, whichever teams were supposed – like whoever you're supposed to play from June 1st to the rest of the year, just have that be the schedule. Does have that be the be or if you want to tear the already made schedule that you had and kind of remake a hundred game or like a ninety game uh, schedule for each team, I think that makes sense. But I heard that they were going to try and play like two, three, um, a double a headers a week. That doesn't make sense to me. Try try and squeeze in a hundred games, and if the playoffs go into October, November, the, um, December. Okay, cool. If the season has to go into next year, absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. I, there's no reason why the 2020 season should stretch to the 2021 year. So I think they can, but I would give them a, a absolute latest start date of June or July 4th. If they're not going by um, uh, July 4th, Let's cancel it at that point. Yeah, I'm I'm actually I'm pessimistic about us getting a season. Um, the reason B is I think there are just too many moving parts. So with the NBA, I'm a little more optimistic because they could condense. There was about 16 games left in the NBA season. And so if you wanted, you can technically condense that down and say, hey, look, we'll play eight games leading into the playoffs, and that'll kind of be your warm-up to get to the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Um, with baseball, because there hasn't been any games played. We didn't even get a spring training. Um, right. The quarantine kind of took effect as play, pitchers and catchers and positional players were starting to report. So we right. didn't even get that. So we're going to have to at least give these guys a month to get themselves ready for a season. And as you mentioned, if we're already into June, possibly even July, now we're talking about not even starting the season until August. Um, and the biggest hurdle then becomes, I do not think Major League Baseball wants to go up against NFL football, college football, and then potentially NBA basketball starting, NBA again. Basketball. you know, right. they, they already struggle with the ratings aspect of it. And if they're not even getting their season started till August when college football is back in effect, 
and then the NFL is kind of gearing up to get started as well, they know they're going to take a beating in the ratings. And I don't think they want to go up against those type of juggernauts, um, especially when if we go all this time without any sports at all, and then we get sports in August, we're going to be hyped for what a potential NBA finals would look like, what an NFL season is going to look like. Major League Baseball is really going to be like our fourth option at that point. And I don't know if they want to go up against it. But I do agree with you. You can't, at this point, you cannot squeeze in 162 games. You got to go with whatever's available to you. Even if you just play the second half of the season, if you say, hey, look, all-star right. game, all-star game would have been middle of July. We'll just play out the schedule from July on and exactly. get ourselves geared up. I agree with that. I hope we do get it because Pete Alonzo was very exciting last year. Um, but I'm not. Pete Alonzo, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pessimistic about it, but I do hope that we get it, man. I that is a great point. I didn't even think of, yo, if they go into October, November, that's the college NFL. And not only is that college football, that's college basketball too. Right. Yep. So, so it's just like, now you're trying to compete against four or five sports now. Yeah. And it's just like, so yeah, so, um, so, so that's a very good point. In terms of the Mets, as much as I, was hyped to see um, uh, Pete for year number two. I was driving home from work and I was like, oh, breaking news. I'm like, and it involves the Mets. I'm like, here we go. <laughs> Syndergaard needs uh, Tommy John. Eric, I could have threw my phone out the damn window. Because <laughs> it's like, it's like something always, it's, it's like we just never get good news. We just never get good news. So as much as I'm hyped to see Pete, and if he could get the 50-plus again, knowing that we're not going to have uh, Syndergaard for the whole of this year and probably half of uh, next year, too, it was going to be very interesting to see Matt step up his game, Strowman step up his game, and can the ground win a third straight uh, Cy Young. So I hope you get a chance to see that, but not having uh, Syndergaard stings just a tad, tad bit. Absolutely. I agree. And I, I listen, I don't know if – I, I'm rooting for DeGrom when we come back to make the push for the third. But DeGrom, if he does, that puts him in legendary status if he can get to that point. But ultimately, we got to wait out and see, man. Bro, I appreciate you tuning in today and checking in, man, letting us know what's going on with you guys. Um, we're going to be watching the draft. Um, if we're not playing you guys, and when I say if, I mean the Colts and Titans, I'm rooting for you guys. <laughs> when we play, we, we ain't rooting for nothing. You guys are doing it over there. It's actually crazy, man. That Titans win at the Colts, that's what started that run yeah. that we had because we were yeah. a six, um, a six and six. And I'm like, well, well, we never beat um the beat of them, and then we did, and we went seven and six, and then we just yeah, made that run. So, same thing to you, man. Once the Titans are not playing the Colts, and I actually have a bunch of Colts, coach, um, friends that are Colts fans too, man. So, I'm rooting for y'all when we don't play y'all, man. And Eric, thank you for having me on, and. Hopefully, we could all physically see uh, each other soon, man. <laughs> Absolutely, bro. We'll, we'll tune in real soon, man. All right, baby. All right. I appreciate you, man. No doubt, man. Smush Parker here, formerly up to Los Angeles Lakers. And you are now tuned in to Real Fans, Real Talk. Live from the camp. Live the camp. Uh-huh. This is Real Fans, Real Talk. Real Fans, Real Talk. We as real as you thought.